Um, all right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I've got a brief uh, few slides here before we turn everything over to our presenter. But uh, again, always welcome here to the Photography Club. Let me get rid of this. Um, and uh, again, it's March, so we're, oops. Um, so a quick uh, agenda of our, you know, for upcoming events. Uh, tonight, we have Jennifer King, and I don't know if you'll remember, but this is our third shot at having her present. Uh, she, she got stuck in Iceland one time, and another time we, uh, I think, uh, she, she had a lightning strike and lost power to her house. And uh, so uh, tonight, hopefully nothing will go wrong, but also I want to remind everybody, this is going to be our last meeting here in the library. We'll probably go into either Zoom meet, oops, sorry. Uh, I'm really not going back. Give me just a second. Everything's... Well, yeah, that's what I'm hitting. <laughs> uh, it sounds like well, we do that. Anyhow, um, back to where we were. Uh, we'll also be doing some, you know, in-person type things, uh, you know, and I'll go over a few of those in a minute. On April 16th, uh, we're going to have the crew that went on the Yellowstone trip uh, review that particular, their trip and all the excitement they had since they probably had the, uh, arguably the best luck of anybody in the trips in the recent years. Uh, and again, that will be Zoom only. And then in May, we're going to have a contest and the theme on this contest is going to be black and white. And so you should really pay attention to Jennifer's presentation tonight. Um, and then in June, uh, Kathy Aronson has graciously is going to provide her home and her mega super duper printer. And we're going to have a printing event for, uh, and we'll have a, a lot of details coming out about that. So, but pay attention to the details because it'll be a, a limited amount of people who can participate. And then uh, we don't have the date nailed down yet, but we're going to try to do a scavenger hunt for uh, July. So uh, anyhow, that kind of covers that. And I'm gonna do a brief intro. Uh, there's really too much to say about looking at Jennifer's background here, but other than say she's, she's one of a lot of awards, she's an educator. I would say, take a look at her website. I, I, I love her photography uh, and she's done, you know, so many things uh, and, but, uh, also, I think it, but one of the key things is, she, is she's the founder of this uh, photography for the fight, photography for the fight against breast cancer, and I, I think that's a, a a great thing. And I I know her; she's the founder, and there's another a number of other photographers, oh, man, uh, involved in that. So, and the other key thing here is she will be our judge for the May contest on black and white. So once again. Yeah uh pay attention tonight so anyhow i'm going to turn it over to jennifer since i seem to be having all kind of problems with my slideshow uh and we'll get started well thank you so much david and thank you for having me and coming out to share photography tonight um i am happy to be here i know the tonight we were sitting in the living room because i'm in the on the east coast right now and heard this huge crash we knew it was a tree or a limb coming down <laughs> And you could hear it and it landed right in front of the window. And I was like, oh, no, check the internet, <laughs> make sure it's working. <laughs> so, oh, my goodness, I, I am happy to be here and I appreciate everyone coming out tonight. All right, we are going to talk about black and white photography and I am going to share my monitor. And here we go. All right, the art of black and white photography. There is something that is quite magical about black and white photography. Like I, when I look at it, I see a silver-like component that creates a sense of illusion 
um, dark, moody tones produce an emotional response. And there's light that brings each image to life. And from the many genres of art throughout history, there is one form that remains as powerful today as when it first started, and that is the art of photography. Now, since the creation of the photographic process, the art of photography has been rendered through time by many photographers in very different ways, always translate, translating changes in our world, um, capturing our lives and enriching our vision. What makes black and white photography so appealing to so many photographers? Is it the drama of the dark tones or the mystery that is created or the feeling that it's more than just a photo, that it's a piece of art? I consider black and white photography to be fine art photography and not because color loses anything in translation, but because working in black and white allows us to simply deviate from the norm, to create something both behind the lens and in processing that is different than what we see with our eyes. It's a way of approaching your subject completely different than you normally would and trying to capture the scene by the art of the light. It's a way of viewing a subject, in my case, nature, with the intent to create something different than how it appears to most people. One of the most important things to realize about black and white photography is that it can translate into a form of fine art. And it's very different from color landscape photography, which focuses usually on realism and what you see through your lens. Black and white photography is a departure from reality. It is an illusion because most of us see in color. So how do we learn to transition from our nature and landscape photography to a fine art approach? We learn to visualize. Learning to become a fine art photographer is easier than it sounds. Pablo Picasso once said, every child is an artist. The problem is staying an artist when you grow up. And this is very true. I see this most of all when I'm playing with the children in my family. This is my niece, Naomi. You know, humans, we're creative by nature. So how do we find our inner artist after we become distracted adults? Well, we use our senses instead of our minds. And it's very easy to watch our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, when they're playing, when they're small, they have no sense of distraction other than maybe what they want at that moment. And that's a childlike quality that would be wonderful if we could all return to. But our senses allow us to do that. Sight, sound, touch. These are physical senses that can help us connect to our subject. But there are more than just physical senses. There are cognitive senses as well, like our feelings, our emotions. And I know, you know, it's always awkward to talk about feelings, of course, but it is feelings, emotions, reactions to everyday life that help us to connect to pretty much everything in our world. So why not use those feelings or emotions to connect to nature? Let's break down our senses even a little bit more. We have fear, we have happiness, anxiety, peacefulness, peacefulness. So if we take one of those that we might be feeling and mix it with one of our standard senses, like sound, for instance. For an example, when I am photographing on the sand dunes in Death Valley, and I'm usually out there two to three weeks every year, I'm listening to music all the time. And when I take groups out there and teach, I give them a moment to listen to music and try and connect as well. So if you're ever out there and you hear music, Pink Floyd probably on the dunes, come over and say hello. 
Um, the point isn't necessarily that music that I listen to, but I do react to it. And that always puts me in a state of mind where I may be contemplating things in my life. Um, and that moment of combining sound with a feeling gives me some kind of burst of visualization, the ability to visualize, or, you know, I'm thinking about where I've lived, memories that come over a reflection of time, but I am able to connect to that kind of stuff when I can find something that puts me in the right mindset. And we all go through periods in our lives when our emotions are more prominent in our daily lives for a multitude of reasons. I, in March, 2020, I had flown from Norway. I was in the um, islands over there, the Lofoten Islands. And I got to Las Vegas. I got to a grocery store. There was nothing on the shelves. I didn't know what was going on. Nobody told me we were ready to shut the world down. And I had Death Valley to myself as it was closing around me. So I photographed. But during that time, I was able to tap into my fear and put that emotion into my work. What I learned in that very short amount of time that I had the park to myself is that there is a difference between converting an image to black and white and creating a black and white photo. And that's when my approach to photography changed. From that time forward, my focus turned to placing myself in the moment, incorporating my senses, my emotions, and my vision to whatever landscape I was photographing. So how can we do this? Well, a great way to tap into ourselves is to practice some basic visualization techniques. You know, say for example, you're gonna go to the coast um, and photograph, you know, before you leave home, spend 15 to 20 minutes searching for photos of the area that you're going to, to help you see what is attracting you visually, you know, get some visual stimulation. What kind of photos did you react to? Um, were they long exposures of water? Maybe you're drawn to reflections in the sand. I always make notes of what triggered my visual response to someone else's photos, and I make that my target subject. We can always work on our approach. And one thing I want to mention is we, you know, I don't, never did before, and most people don't think of black and white photography as having a high dynamic range, but it does. There are 256 shades of gray in your JPEG, and you'll need to choose which of these shades or tones you want to emphasize. Contrast is a great tool for black and white photography. So I choose to photograph in high contrast light because I personally like the darker tones and the brighter whites. Creating fine art through photography is not so much about what you photograph and a lot more about how you photograph. And visualization plays an important role. Try to practice basic techniques to help you approach photography in a new or different way, like meditation, or simply taking a couple of deep breaths so that you can relax. Fine tuning your creative side is not a race to the finish line. And in most cases, we're not racing against the sun. When I arrive at a destination, I, I close my eyes for a moment and I picture whatever image or the subject I chose, that visual stimulation I got from my research. And once I have a mental image of what I want to achieve, I put myself into the image. I think about somebody that's important to me or a special memory. And, you know, if you're thinking about work or what you need to do, just stop. <laughs> Take a couple more deep breaths and try again. 
we have to learn how to separate ourselves from distractions as distracted adults to be able to get in that mindset that can really help us elevate our creativity. And if you're questioning what your settings should be at this point, stop, because you'll figure that out in just a few minutes. These moments of approaching photography and relaxing or letting go might make you feel a little bit out of control or strange at first, but you're not out of control. You're simply exploring how to express yourself through photography and on your way to achieving new ways to grow as an artist. When I approach my subject, my intention is to create an image that invokes an emotional response. I want the viewer to feel as though they've stepped into the scene and get to experience the drama and the power of that same moment I'm photographing. My black and white images are designed so the viewer reacts to the light, to the shadow, the shapes. To do this, I approach my black and white photography differently than I do any other landscape photography because I go with the intention to photograph in black and white. So in other words, my landscape sessions and my black and white sessions are completely separate. This allows me to put myself in that mindset to view the landscape, not by color or clouds or even foreground, but instead I look for the highlights. And once I find the highlights, I can then choose the lens and my position with the camera to that light to capture the drama that's occurring in nature. The best advice I have for any photographer who is exploring black and white photography and their inner artist is to just slow down. Take your time to visually explore the light. I begin my photo sessions looking with my eyes first instead of through the lens. What is the light touching? Does it make an interesting shape or does it enhance a part of the subject itself? Then I consider which lens would work best to accomplish what I'm seeing with my eyes. And once you begin to photograph by the light and not the landscape, you begin to see landscape differently. Look for the light in the shadow and you will find drama. Remember, fine art photography is not based in realism, neither is black and white photography. So allow yourself to get creative with what you're doing. Change the look and appearance from what you see with your eyes to what you envision. Remember those images that you saw during your research you reacted to? Think about those for a moment. See if you can creatively translate that into what's in front of you right now. And then you put yourself in your mood into the moment of photographing. Do you feel happy, sad, intense? Tune in with all that's going on around you. Is the air cool? Can you feel the sun on your face? Can you hear the wind? Artists have used emotions and their senses throughout history as a part of the creative process. So allowing yourself to connect, to open up and to react will truly help you find that inner artist that is inside of you, whether you believe it is there or not. You just have to try and you have to practice. Same basic design principles that are used for landscape photography apply in black and white, and it's still important to study and apply the art of composition to your black and white, because this is just going to be the foundation of your photography. For creating black and white images, there are some key design elements that I feel really help to bring the image to life, like the use of foreground details. This can be so crucial for communicating dimension, and it can be extremely powerful in black and white. Having a strong foreground, a middle ground, and a background, this creates depth 
and it increases the vastness in any landscape. And if you have a landscape that doesn't appear vast, a foreground detail is a great way to make it appear vast. And foreground adds drama to your image. The best way to enhance a foreground is to get low or close to the foreground subject. This allows you to play with these spatial relationships because you are exaggerating the entrance to your image. And I would say probably the most important thing that a strong foreground will do besides create dimension is it can create a sense of placement. You know, anytime that you provide something in the foreground, the viewer will feel a sense of connection to your image. Give the viewer a place to step into your landscape or something for them to reach out and touch so they can feel a part of your photo. Lines are also wonderful for black and white photography. And one of the most effective ways to immediately capture a viewer's attention is through a line. There are so many studies out there um, where information shows that your eyes are going to follow a line. And a lot of studies throughout the visual art industry over the last many decades about this. Lines can be one of the strongest structural elements in the entire visual art industry because they simply draw the viewer in. They hold attention, you know, and often create striking images. Eyes are designed to move and lines can give a viewer direction into your photo. Leading lines are very effective if you want to point the viewer to a subject, mm -hmm. but can also create a mysterious or abstract image. And from a creative standpoint, images with lines as a dominant element, they can be strong and powerful. If they're curved, they can be sensual. Lines in a photo, can make images more powerful on their own without any second or third element in there. So that's just something to keep in mind. And when you can mix lines with patterns and textures and highlight and shadow, you can walk away some, with some pretty graphic images of nature itself. And because they are so graphic, that type of subject translates really well into black and white. So I'm always looking for those elements when I'm in the field. There is little that shows the beauty of nature as well as simplicity. The impact of a simple subject cannot be outweighed artistically or by any grandeur or convey a story more powerful than just plain simplicity. Beauty, it's in the light, it's in the shapes. And whether it's a landscape or a detail of nature, the artist's simplicity can be extremely powerful in black and white. My favorite images are taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens or my one to 400 millimeter. Using a longer lens for landscape or any subject, it allows me to isolate the dramatic light that I'm seeing, and therefore I'm able to compose and try and draw your eye directly into that light that's touching your subject. Remember, not everything needs to be a grand landscape. Sometimes the light, the line, the simplicity of your scene will communicate more intensity than a complex image can. We don't normally think of black and white as having a di high dynamic range. I mentioned that a little while ago, 256 shades of gray. These tones become a part of your style. It's a part of creating your style. All of those grays that I mentioned from 100% black to 0% black creating white and everything in between is gonna make up your tonality. Now, Ansel Adams, he used um, the zone system for his photography. And while I don't use the scale myself, it is a great teaching tool. He used 11 shades of gray in his work, making sure that each tone was represented in all of, all of his images. Personally, I like that really high contrast approach 
but that's just my personal preference. Ansel Adams was an amazing photographer and artist and a brilliant instructor, but we just have different styles and that's okay to have a different style. I will say contrast is one of the greatest tools in photography. And I choose to photograph in high contrast light because I really like the bright whites, the dark tones. What does that mean? It means I can photograph in the middle of the day, which is kind of nice. <laughs> Images that are dark or low key in style, they often create an emotional response because they a dark tone reflects mood, intensity, and sometimes a bit of mystery. You can also approach this black and white photography as a minimalistic style or high key with your images. Bright images uh, with a lot of white are often felt as peaceful and serene. And bright tones, overall bright tones in black and white, create a sense of relaxation for the viewer. And many artists are attracted to this style of black and white because they are reacting emotionally which is wonderful. And we all love that sense of relaxation. Always photograph in raw format. This will allow you to capture as many colors as possible with the highest amount of color range and depth. So why is this important for black and white photography? Well, even though you're processing in black and white, your colors become your tones. Tonality will range from black to white to all points of gray, and this becomes especially important in processing. Watch your histogram. This is so very important while you're taking the photo and every bit as much while you're processing the photo. You don't want to blow out your highlights or lose any detail on the blacks. Your histogram is the best tool for successful photography, always. Now, if you're struggling with black and white in the field, your camera probably has a setting to preview the image in monochrome. If you're photographing in raw, the image still comes into your computer in color, but seeing it in monochrome or black and white in the viewfinder can be very helpful to somebody who's trying to learn the art of black and white photography. It can assist you when you're learning to transition from possibly realism landscape photography. I always use filters in the field, always. I have a polarizer, I have my graduated neutral density filters and I have neutral density filters for long exposures and they can be every bit as effective for black and white as it is for color. Every bit of information that you put into your raw file the smoother the transition will be in processing. Black and white photography is a two-step process, capturing the image by using your visualization and creativity behind the camera, and then bringing the image to life when you're at your computer. Now, there are many programs and techniques for processing black and white images. Personally, I use Adobe Lightroom because the, right now they have evolved so much over the years that they have all the tools necessary to get the job done. Lightroom does offer some presets that you can use for processing your images, but I've always found that as the artist, Self-processing puts more of my ideas and creativity into that final image. Finding your style doesn't end behind the camera. Processing is very important and an important step in the development and growth as an artist. It will help you find and define your style of art. This is something that will develop over time, but you can get started by trying to determine what style you like. And to do this, I recommend that you study the presets from Nick software, Silver Effects Pro. This plugin can be used with Lightroom. It will allow you to view your photo with many different um, templates, uh, you know, pr presets applied to it. 
you see them in different styles. And if you continue to go through the stage of opening your image in Silver FX Pro, you'll look at images and you'll find over time that there's probably just a couple of styles that you are drawn to. And these styles are named by Silver FX. So it's really nice to see that you start going through that whole list of 25 or more different templates of one image and you land on one or two repeatedly with different images, you know what style you like. Now you know what to look for when you're processing. I do encourage photographers not to rely on the presets because that's somebody else processing for you, basically a computer. But you can enhance, you can learn to improve what you see if you're editing it in the photos yourself, I do want to stress that. I believe truly that the processing phase of black and white photography has made me better at photographing and processing everything that I photograph. So my for my black and white photography, I've learned to compose by the light, not so much the landscape. Let's make a note of some things to look for in the field that can help you with visualization. Highlights. What is the light touching? Where are the whites? Understanding that shadows complement highlights is very important because these contrasty sections of the landscape may produce, probably will, your most interesting photos. A black color looks black when it's next to white, but not so much when it's next to 80% gray. Find the shot with your eyes first and then set up your camera. Remember, we are not racing. You could do this work in the middle of the day and breathe. Remember to breathe. It is not a race to the finish line. We all get excited about going out to photograph, but approaching black and white differently than you would approach landscape will help you create stronger fine art images. Own your look and know that there is absolutely no right or wrong when it comes to art. It is your creation and you can choose your own look. Getting in touch with your inner artist, it does take some time and it takes practice and I'm still continually working on mine, but I know that and I'm okay with that. So I wanna stress how important it is to take the time and find that artist within. For me, it took separating myself from everything I knew as normal photography and allowing myself to go a completely different way. The more genres and styles of photography that you practice, the more you're going to learn about yourself and your artistic style. This will apply to all of your photography going forward. Black and white photography, it's full of drama, mystery. It can be very inspirational. And these images will be the best ones if you're putting yourself into them. Photography is a journey. Please enjoy your adventure. Now, before I am going to disconnect here for just a minute, I believe it's extremely important to not just talk about how to find your artist within and learn how to try and connect, but also to do a little bit of processing. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to share my Lightroom. And I had shown one of these images in my presentation. I want to make sure that you can see it. I'm trying to find my Lightroom. And is everyone able to see it? Yeah, we can see that. Perfect. Okay. So this is an image I took in 2022. I went to Iceland for a couple of weeks. And my intention was to photograph Iceland, black and white only. This was the first time I had done that. But I do that now to a lot of places. I will make a black and white trip and stick to black and white because everything that I do and I learn, I improve so much every time I do that. 
I'd already been there many times and have photographed most of these locations uh, on this trip as well in the past. So I want to show you what my raw file looks like and, and just take it from there and give you some suggestions. So there's my raw file. Kind of boring, right? <laughs> um, anyway, it was not the greatest day for light. It was very early in the morning, which was nice. There weren't as many people around. This is Skogafoss Waterfall, if you've been there. Um, the first thing I do for every processing session I have, and this is black and white or color, but I do pay attention to the framing of the subject. So one of the first things that I will always do is just work on the framing. And I know that I was a little bit too wide here and I'm probably gonna bring this down and I have a little bit too much white in there for a black and white anyway. Once I get my framing and composition done and in the right place, I simply go to my basic menu and I convert to black and white. Now, there are a lot of black and white photographers out there, and we probably all do it very differently. For me, coming from landscape photography and color photography, I felt that the processing stage worked better to begin from black and white. And so I want to show you how I do that to try and help you see it a little differently. Okay, so let me reframe that a bit. So I'm in black and white now, and it's very easy for me to see where the whites are, where the blacks are, where the grays are, right? Because there's no color competing for my attention. So that's something that's very important to note. We have no color. So everything that we do is to help us draw in, bring out the drama in the black and white tones. So I do, I start with my usual edits, um, global edits, but instead of working in the basic menu here, I close that and I come down to the tone curve. Your basic menu, it has highlights and shadows. It has black and whites, but your tone curve area, you can work this in effect highlights and lights, darks and shadows. The highlights and lights are a different pixel range than you're going to get in the basic menu. So it's a more refined way to process, especially tonality. And same with the darks and shadows. You just have shadows and blacks. That's pretty limiting in the basic menu. But we have two different sliders here that we can use to change that. So again, it's a smaller range of pixels you are selecting. So the edits become a little finer and not as noticeable. So I start with bringing out my highlights as a whole. I'm always watching my histogram. I know I'm gonna have some white blowing out, but globally we'll start right here. I may bring up the darks just a little bit, but what I love is to bring up the darks and then start to bring down the shadows because highlights and shadows work really well together. All right, there we are. Now, I can take a look at some things, maybe not in this case necessarily, but we'll take a look at uh, clarity. It's been a couple of years since I've processed this, but yeah, a little clarity helps to bring out the rock, which is really adding to the image. Once I am happy with my global edits, I go into localized edits um, and I do that with the masking tool. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna choose my favorite tool for dodging or burning, and that is the radial gradient. It is the most forgiving tool in the entire toolbox here. So radial gradient, I make sure there's some feathering on. I usually like to be 50 to 70, depending on what I'm doing. But if it's a small area like the sky, then you know I may pull that down a little bit. I usually get a question about this point. Why not just use the sky selection? The sky selection does work sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. But we can take a look here and say, see what happens if I select the sky. That's actually not too bad. It, it selects the top of the waterfall, but I probably would have gotten that anyway. So I'm going to come down here. I start bringing highlights down. I start bringing my exposure down, my whites, but let's start to bring it in right there. But you'll notice how specific that line is at the top of the waterfall. And I say, okay, I don't like it. So I usually end up going back to burn and dodging with that radio filter because it just is very, it's much more forgiving. 
So you can see I'm still going to have feathering there. I'll have some of the dark bleeding in, um, but not enough to make it look like a consistent line that we were getting. And I am going to temporar temporarily close the histogram so I can be working in this menu, but I'll start with maybe bringing exposure down. I can nudge this down a little bit. I may want to increase um, one of the best tools for the sky in black and white photography is going to be um, either the clarity tool or the dehaze. It's a, it's a fantastic tool, but I also want to mention that everything we're doing in black and white photography, we are introducing noise, but that's something I usually address at the end of the image. I can bring the feathering down a little bit, maybe try and bring that up. We'll just start for there right now. Yes, it's obvious, but I'm not quite done yet. <laughs> One of the next things I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to dodge and burn all of the areas that I believe we can make something stand out. So I'm going to do another radial gradient. I'm going to do it here on the water specifically. When we're using things like brushes, sometimes in all processing, it's very easy to tell where somebody's made a change because they haven't gotten the outline correct with the pen tool or whatever they're using, which is another reason why I absolutely love this tool. Because look at that radio filter. You just don't see the edges. And that's amazing that we can do that. All right. So now that my eye is going to the white a little bit more on the water instead of the sky, um, it's easier for me to look at the image as a whole. So I know I still need to tweak this a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and bring it down for the moment and just make it a little less distracting for me. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to study this photo. Let's take a look here. I see lighter color and texture here, right? We have a lot of black here. We could bring that out a little bit. We have a lot of nice light coming in here, and we were able to exaggerate some of that with the um, clarity tool that I had used as a global processing. But what I want to do is I want to get some of the darks to brighten up a little bit. It's all about balancing the tonality to the style that you like. So let's come down here and see what happens if we bring some clarity out here. Clarity is a sharpening tool, both texture clarity and dehaze. These are all sharpening tools. So what it's doing is it's sharpening the, the range of tonality when you're in black and white. So look at how those rocks in the foreground start to come out. Now I'm adding dimension in here, which is really starting to get nice. Another thing I could do would be to maybe vignette. Now, a lot of times I will come down to my auto vignette down here under effects just to get a look of where maybe I do want a vignette. I don't want to do all sides necessarily. Maybe I do. But it gives me an idea of what corners are going to look best. I don't necessarily want vignetting down here. I probably just want a little bit right in there. But it allows me to see that. So then I can come up here. I can say, let's create another radial filter. I can make a really large one just to have the red in that corner, like right there. By zooming out, I can come up here and say, let's invert. And now the, the mask is only going to apply to that area right there. So I go back to fit to my screen. That's dark. I'm going to hide my mask by hitting the, the O, letter O. And I can start bringing down highlights. I can start with exposure just a little bit to darken that a little bit right there. And then I still have to work on the sky, but that's what I continue to do for all of my photos. And sometimes the sky can be the most challenging and sometimes it's just a little overpowering, but you're the artist and you get to decide how it works the best. And just to give you an idea, that may be a little bit too much um, right here, but this is where I started. And this is the one that I have printed, which I love. I want you to notice a couple things. I have adopted my style, which is very high contrast. But if you look at the histogram here, there's very little that's actually black. So for printing, this actually works. But if I need to, if I have an area that has a little bit of more black in it, I can simply just quickly do a brush even like we'll say right here, hide it 
and let's just reduce a little bit of the black there. If you're just reducing a couple of points, you're going to be fine. Let me close that again for the moment. I could just say, okay, black, it's gone. <laughs> it didn't take much. And the, uh, most of these places right here, that's not enough black on a print for me to worry about. But I want everyone to notice actually is how many burn and dodge areas I have on this image. So we have one right here where I highlighted that edge of the stone. I did a little bit more here and here I did that whole area. Notice that I had the similar shape over there, but I also took the, the uh, artistic approach right here, put another filter on there just to bring this part of the rock out. Looks like I did a little dodging and burning. Well, that was actually filling in the black right there. And I did some more processing there and with my sky. So every time I have a black and white photo, I can have, depending on the complexity of the image, I may have 10 masks where I've burned or dodged an area. And sometimes I have 30. It really just depends on what I'm doing or what I'm looking for. I'm going to come over here as well and show another one from that Iceland trip. So we took photos that morning. It wasn't a dynamic uh, morning whatsoever, but there's enough there and it's Iceland and we're going to make it work. So I work on my framing first or cropping, straightening, any kind of um, tilting lines. I'm going to convert to black and white and I'm going to start processing. One of the things that I absolutely love doing in black and white is working with my filters, my graduated, my radial anything to bring out the highlights. So we have plenty of highlights in the sky, but I know that all of that can be white because it was to my eye when I was photographing. We can bring up whites, more likely. Let's bring out some clarity, texture. We can take some dehaze out of it to bring up a little more white and maybe even just a little more exposure. Now this image is starting to come to life because I'm worried we can do some global processing, which is important to get you to a point where you can separate the lights and darks and then try and get the image processed with the way you envisioned it. Another amazing set of tools here are the black and white filters. These are, these are the same filters you would be using if you had filters on your film camera out in the field. So you can click on any, you can click on this menu, you can select this icon right here, and you can drag and drop it anywhere in the photo to change uh, the color. And you could see it's affecting a lot of blue because there was a blue sky. This can help you really bring the image to life. But I will say the more I use the black and white filters, the more noise that I get. So for me, uh, an important thing to do is to remove that noise, but I do wait to the end of processing simply because every edit I'm going to make from clarity to dehaze to the black and white filters, all of those are going to add noise in. So I'd rather be done processing and knowing how to process. There are two different things we can do. Uh, Lightroom does have, let's see, detail. They have a new denoise, which I'm getting used to. Um, I also have Topaz Photo AI for noise, used to use DxO. I think the message is most important that you, for black and white photography, you're probably going to want to reduce some of the noise after you've done a lot of edits. This is AI, so it's just going to calculate something. I can change the amount that I want to add to it, and I would hit enhance, and then we're done. And you can see over here, I want to show you the image that I did the my final one that I had done before you can see everything from brushes and linear gradients and stuff all through the image so let's go over here and turn on my dodging and burning and let's look at my histogram that's an excellent histogram for black and white I would say to me the best histograms are the ones that are spread out even if you have a lot of dark or white when we're doing landscape photography that you know circular arc or that triangle in the center of your histogram is perfect. We don't have color. We just have gray. So being able to stretch out the histogram like this, I believe, makes a strong image. 
So let's get up here. How many of these did I have? I had, I turned down the highlight on the sky. I would have done something over here. You could see all these little burning and dodges. That was a gradient. I had another gradient on top of selecting probably a luminance range here. Yeah, selecting the luminance range so I could bring up the black a little bit. So one thing I want to mention is when I am doing a black and white image, I'm not racing. I didn't race in the field and I'm not going to race behind the computer. I will process for a while. And then I will come back and I will make virtual copies of everything. I will set the image aside for a couple of days maybe, and I'll come back and take a look at it or possibly process it in a different way. Because I'm creating something here. I'm not just taking the photo, I'm creating an image. So that allows me to take a little more time and not feel rushed to, to bring it to life the way I envisioned. Does anybody have any press, uh, questions on processing? Uh, we had one uh, question that popped up in the chat. Uh, uh -huh. I think Kyle was asking, uh, you did mention uh, Silver FX Pro. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you might just comment on if you use that. But I think Kyle also asked the question is, can you do that from Lightroom? And the answer is yes, it can be a plug-in. It can be. So yeah. for Silver FX Pro, I, you know, the reason I really try and encourage people to do their own processing, it has to do with learning. Everything that you can self-process on your own and put into your art, it does create better images. But I also feel it's very beneficial to find out or figure out what style you like the best. And you have so many different um, presets here that you could take a look at. And I found not only with myself, but everyone, because I teach a lot of black and white um, workshops, is that the people that actually do this, <laughs> will do it in class, the people will pick two or three on all their images. They come back to the same ones almost every time. Well, this is full dynamic. That means they're using a very wide dynamic range for this scene, where you may have some that are fine art, a lot lighter and a lot brighter. This may not be the best image to use as an example, but you continually come back to these presets. That helps you define what it is that you like. So I will close without saving that, but I, I did want to demonstrate that because I think that's actually very important. It's an important part of learning to see what styles are out there. A lot of these styles are from photography. Some are fine art styles. You know, art has been around a very long time. <laughs> Artists going back in history for centuries have used all the things I'm talking about. They use visualization. They put their own style into it, a style that develops over time. Um, they look at different people's work. And it's not to copy anybody else. It's just to see what you react to. I think that's the most important thing about looking at other people's work. So great questions on, on the silver effects. Yeah, okay, we have one here. Uh, hang on just a second. Yeah, okay. yeah, I see you're using Lightroom Classic. Do you not use the cloud for some reason? Um, What's that? I, well, I'd have to ask one of the guys that sets up my stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Is the program actually different? I know some people will come to a class and they have a different version on the cloud. It just doesn't have quite all the tools, I believe, but it has the majority of them. So, um, no, I just process everything when I'm traveling. I don't process a lot, but I will do my image selection. And then from there, um, when I get back to the studio, I can take images and, and upload them to the cloud there. But I, I do work in Lightroom Classic. Okay. That's a great question. I don't really know the answer to. <laughs> I can give you more detail on that okay. later if you'd like. So, uh -huh. so uh, all right. Well, are there any other questions out there? <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. We have one here in the. You have a tiny question. Can you achieve much of what you? You said you shoot with filters. Mm -hmm. Can you achieve the same effects or something similar post processing without using filters? 
I don't uh, so believe you can. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was. I, a, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I heard him. I was just uh, trying to make sure you heard the question. I did. Um, I have always found, and I've tested this theory too, that you get more information, albeit sometimes it's a little bit, but the more information you get in the raw file, the more natural the transition. That's not to say I don't try and do it sometimes if I haven't used a filter or I forgot a filter or something like that, or I broke a filter. Um, I certainly will try it in processing, but the transition is going to be smoother if you have a filter on in the field. And I know when Lightroom came out, a lot of professional photographers start saying, oh, well, you'll need filters anymore, this, that, and the other. But I can assure you, I've heard people say that, and then I've seen them photographing with filters in the field. I use my filters all the time, unless I scratch one, drop one, break one. I'm clumsy, so that's pretty common. Um, but I do. I just use them all the time, and I know I'm going to get the best result. And again, we've tested this in workshops, showing people use it here, don't use it here, um, do it in processing, and you can see it just side by side. I would recommend that you do that in some cases, that you actually, if you're going to use a filter in the field, take um, some photos that you somehow mark and know, maybe separate them with your hand in between a selection of photos, and you can say, these had no filters, these had filters, do the processing and see which one is more realistic to your eye. Excellent questions. Yeah, so um, I'll just go back. Do you still use any of silver effects or do you did you just use that to try to just it's a, to get your style? It's a, yeah, it's a teaching tool. When okay. I, this was a little while ago, but that I want to say it was in 2021. Until that point, if you used silver effects or some of these other programs, they would convert your image into a um, an eight instead of a 16 gig color profile. And what that did at the time is it would um, take away half of your color. And color in black and white is tonality. So it made no sense early on. Silver FX has corrected that and you can export it as a 16-bit file. But um, at the same time back then, I didn't have that option because if I'm printing large prints here in the studio, then I want all of those bits of information until I am complete and then I can downsize the image to an 8-bit. So I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I, I, I got a question. Can you hear me? I can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know much about landscape. I do mostly wildlife, but um, and and I, I really do like black and white. I mean, for many of the reasons that you kind of expressed Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to your aperture and, I, I, and you know, I, I, from my understanding, a lot of landscape wow. photographers have a pretty general like, oh, yeah, F13 or F11. Um, is Would you say that's kind of the same with you or do you have like another situation where uh, maybe maybe you're not trying to get that much depth? Um yeah, that's that's actually an excellent question. I started photographing and learned in the Grand Tetons, and uh, that was a little while ago. I took um, I started in two thousand and eight, just going out there because I love the animals, and I'd carry a camera. Had no idea what an f stop was or how to use them, but I had fun. And then in twenty eleven, I went out there several times for weeks at a time, actually, and I photographed wildlife didn't know how to do a landscape. So when it was time to do a landscape, I really had my work cut out for me. What I advise people to do is to break down your images into three categories. Wildlife, I'm usually, I'm on a 600 millimeter lens usually, and I have um, like a 5.6, even though it's a 4.0 lens. Um, for landscape photography, I'm at an F16. And for any kind of detail, I may be at an F11. Now, why do I do this? I want three different ranges that give me a very specific look. And while there are slight variations between 16 and 11, I know that if I'm using F16 on a landscape, I'm going to get the depth of field that I need to bring everything into focus. Now, that doesn't mean that I want it all that way because sometimes I, I do come back or I think about it and say I'd like a more shallow depth of field. But if you're going to learn a different genre of photography, I think it's important to know which f-stops you could put each 
category into. And, and once you get comfortable with them, then it's like the door is open. <laughs> you can play with all kinds of f-stops. But for landscape, I just, it's a general rule that I go by F16. And I do teach people that when they're learning, most people do love wildlife photography and then they get into landscape. It is a different monster, <laughs> something different to learn. Great questions. Oh, well, we had a question about, do you do any work with film? I do not, but there are three or four, four by five film cameras in this studio right now. Um, I have not been the one using them. My husband has been, and I'm probably going to take one before long and get out there and play. <laughs> but I started photography in the digital age. Um, I'm pretty sure it was the digital age. Like I said, in 2008 and 2009, when I was coming out there just for an escape, you know, just to get away from work. I didn't know what I was doing. I had the camera on. I don't think a photo ever turned out, but it was fun. Anything here? Any more questions? Wow, it's a quiet group again. <laughs> so, um, if we don't have any other questions, I mean, I, I uh, like I said, if you said you're coming out in June, certainly give us a call or let us know. We'd be yeah. happy to show you around or, uh, you know, buy you a hot dog or something. So that'd be great. We'd love yeah. to see it. I'm glad we finally got to pull this off because it's our too. third time. Me too. Me <laughs> too. For, for the people who joined late, um, we are going to do a contest in May. The theme is going to be black and white, and Jennifer's going to be our judge. So uh, I hope you picked up some tips. I very <laughs> right. much Anything else from present. anyone? No? Um, Great. Yeah, I had a question. Oh, oh, yeah, I had asked a question in the chat, but I guess you missed it. <laughs> um, I was wondering which filter she likes to use in the field. Which brand or which? Um, no, just which I, filters. I, yeah, which filters? I always have a polarizer with me, and I probably use that one the least of them, but I do always have one and use it sometimes. I use the graduated filter anytime I'm shooting into like a brighter area, or sometimes if I want to artistically affect the dark bottom or a portion of that image because you can actually rotate it it doesn't have to be just dark on top it could be dark on the bottom so i do try and approach a graduated neutral filter with an artistic approach not always just like a sunrise or sunset but i would use those that tool there as well um i use a lot uh, i do a lot of long exposure photography um i have some, i think i have some on the wall um, I like photographing long exposure because if I can get clouds moving, they become very dramatic. Everything that I can do to introduce drama into black and white just makes a stronger image because we have no color. That's, that's the one element that's missing. A lot of times a pink sky gives us the drama, you know, yellow flowers or something like that with black and white there is no color so we have to find every element that we can or create an element that adds more drama into the photo so i use long exposures for clouds a lot and for water of course what do you mean when you're saying a long exposure for the clouds how long so let's see if i can find one here i had i was in yosemite and I let me go back to the presentation real quick. I don't know if I can find it. Huh. I may not be able to find it right now. But I had a long exposure for the clouds in Yosemite. I put on a 10 stop followed by a six stop. It was the middle of the day. And I was able to get, I don't know, 30 seconds out of a, a out of clouds hanging over Yosemite. Um, let me see if I can find it. Are you guys able to see my screen or not at the moment? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Let's see. Nope, it's not there. Oh, because it says share. 
All right, let me stop this one for the moment and let me go back to the presentation because I think I have it in there. Okay. And I will share in just a second. Let me go through and find it real fast. Huh. Well, it won't open. <laughs> I don't know. Technical okay. difficulty. But if you uh if you go to my website, you should be able to see there's a black and white gallery on there and you'll see when the clouds are moving. This was a long exposure on the clouds, but they were not moving directionally, but it did create a lot of drama. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. The one in Yosemite, if you're familiar with it at all, clouds were kind of coming up and over and billowing over the rock. So when I put a 30 second exposure on there, there were lines and the clouds stretched out a long way. So it added a lot of oh, Yeah, I did notice that in that picture. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't bring it up. <laughs> Anyone else? No? All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I'm glad we finally got this yeah. uh, pulled, uh, pulled together. So, Me anyhow. too. I appreciate your yeah. patience. <laughs> All right. Well, thank uh, you, David. I'll be in contact with you on the, uh, on the contest. So, Sounds uh, great. Yeah. Great. All right. Look forward to seeing well, the black and white images. Yeah. They'll be a lot of fun. We, Hopefully Thanks, we can uh, live up uh, you. to your expectations. So. <laughs> I'm sure you <laughs> And black Great. and white works well for wildlife, too. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank, Thank you very much. We'll Thank let everybody you. go. But was there a question somewhere? Nope. All right. Love it. <laughs> At Jennifer, thank you very much. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's thank you great for presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat>